Satan. God didn't create the devil. God created Lucifer, and Lucifer created Satan. That's the free will dynamic. God created Lucifer, the light bearer, the shiny one. God created a beautiful, intelligent being with the free will to love like God loves. And by his free will, the scripture says, you were perfect, in Ezekiel 28 scripture, you, Lucifer, you were perfect in all your ways. You were perfect in all your ways from the day that you were created until iniquity was found in you. God didn't create the devil. Lucifer created the devil. This is the mystery of iniquity. Evil emerged. It's, it was self-actualized by free will in an angel. God didn't create evil. The fall of humanity, however, was more than a moral fall. So the devil rebels against God and he tempts Adam and Eve and they fall. But it was more than a moral fall. Remember, God created human beings in such a manner that they had free will, right? And he gave them dominion. It was more than a moral fall. It was also a governmental fall or an abdication of dominion. So that when Adam and Eve yielded to the temptations of Satan, they didn't merely commit sin in the behavioral moral sense, they committed sin in the sense that the world over which they had dominion or stewardship, they gave it over to a foreign invading force. And Lucifer, now Satan, became the ruler of the world. You find all kinds of evidence of this in the biblical narrative. In Job chapter 1, And the Lord said to Satan, From where do you come? Notice it's a point of origin question. Not what are you doing here? Get out. God says to Satan in this heavenly assemblage, this heavenly conclave or congress, this meeting where, where, where everyone came together, He says to Satan, From where do you come? And Satan answered and said to the Lord, from going to and fro on the earth and walking back and forth on it. This is the language of ownership. You buy a piece of property, you walk the property line. You walk to and fro over what you own and you lay claim. The war between good and evil is a territorial dispute. God gave the territory of planet Earth to human beings to steward and to govern and to have dominion over. Are you tracking? Yes. Hypothetically, if Adam and Eve had never fallen, just to put this in perspective, if they had said no to the temptations of the enemy, if Adam and Eve had never fallen, hypothetically, would they still be alive? Yes. Where would they live? Over in Baghdad somewhere, apparently. Iran. Okay? How old would they be? According to the biblical word, they'd be about 6,000 years old, approximately. Would they look old? Would they look really young? Who would they be to us? They'd be our great, 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 totally great grandparents. And they'd be something else. They'd be the representative heads of the human race. And the earth would be beautiful. It would have been cultivated by free will to produce family units and gardens and beautified properties. There would be no public restrooms. There would be no Taco Bells. Everything would be good. Everything would be beautiful. C.S. Lewis says it like this. There is no neutral ground in the universe. Every square inch, every split second is claimed by God and counterclaimed by Satan. Not only every square inch, not only every split second, but every neuron. The great controversy is not only a great controversy over and about planet Earth as a territory, but your frontal lobe as a territory. Then the devil took Christ up to a high mountain and he did what? He showed him all the kingdoms of the what? The world. You see the continuation of the Genesis 3 narrative here. 
God gave them dominion. Dominion was taken from them by deception. Lucifer now has charge, and he comes to Jesus in the incarnation, and he says, he says, I'll give you, I'll give you all of this, all this authority I will give you and their glory, for this has been delivered to me, given to me, and I can give it to whomever I wish. When he says that the world was given to him, he's referring historically to Genesis 3, to the fall of mankind. So it was a governmental fall as well as a moral fall. The devil gained control of planet Earth. Adam and Eve abdicated the throne. So he's called in Scripture the ruler of this world, the God of this age. The Bible doesn't dispute this. The Bible doesn't say, no, he's not. The Bible said, no, actually he is. We gave him our territory in God's vast universe. We gave him control over the planet upon which we live. The whole world lies under the sway of the wicked one, John says. So, dominion, abdication, then warfare. The warfare between good and evil is first brought to our attention in Genesis chapter 3. Adam and Eve fell into sin. They abdicated the throne of the world and gave it over to a foreign invading force. And then God intervenes and says, but I'm going to put enmity, hostility, between you, he's speaking to the servant, saying, I'm going to put enmity between you and the woman, and between your offspring and her offspring. And then singular, he, some particular singular member of the offspring of the woman, this is messianic, this is a prophecy, the first prophecy promise of Jesus. He will crush your head, serpent, and you will strike his heel. So the imagery here is rich. A Messiah Savior will come into the world and crush the serpent's head under his heel, but his heel will be wounded in the process. Jesus is here depicted. Genesis 3.15 consists of a declaration of war. God says, I'm not giving up planet Earth and the human race. I'm going to embark upon a counteroffensive to take the world back from satanic Control. And so scripture tells us that the war that broke out in heaven and was brought to earth was a particular kind of war that we've already noticed to some degree. War broke out in heaven. The word war here is polemos, from which we get words like poles, like the two poles on a battery, or the North Pole and South Pole, or polemics, Democrats, Republicans. It's a political war. The devil didn't launch his war against God by throwing lightning bolts out of his fingertips but shooting words out of his mouth and insinuating that God is not worthy of our trust. Earth is embroiled in a political war that pits one governing system against another. Ellen White gets to the essence of this when she says that unselfishness, the principle of God's kingdom, is the principle that God, that Satan hates. Its very existence he denies. The entire great controversy between good and evil is on the premise of Satan denying the existence of unselfishness. And essentially, his mantra is, everyone for himself. God doesn't love you, he doesn't have your best interests at heart, so you better look out for number one. And who does number one happen to be? You. Don't live for anybody else, certainly not God, because God doesn't care about you. From the beginning of the great controversy, he, that Satan, has endeavored to prove God's principles of action to be selfish. And he deals it the same way with all who serve God. You're selfish. I'm selfish. Lucifer, Satan says, there is no such thing as love. To disprove Satan's claim is the work of Christ and all who bear his name. This is the origin of evil. This is where we are solving the problem of evil. So there is dominion, abdication, there's a war between good and evil. All of this is on the premise of free will and the potential for love and evil that is inherent in free will. And then there is that part of the story that assures us that there is victory over the powers of evil. Because 1 John 3, 8 summarizes the idea by saying, For this purpose the Son of God was manifested. Why did Jesus come into the world, you guys? Why did Jesus come into the world? That he might destroy the works of the devil. It's warfare language. 
Jesus came to the world to destroy the works of the devil. How did he do it? John chapter 12 tells us how he did it. Now is the judgment of this world. That is the world system. Jesus dying on the cross has passed judgment on the prevailing world order. The way things operate in our world by the principle of selfishness. The cross of Calvary says selfishness is not the highest law. Selfishness is winding down and will be annihilated finally. Amen. Jesus died on the cross and thus passed judgment on selfishness as the governing principle of humanity and the ruler of this world. Well, at the cross, when Jesus died on the cross, the ruler of this world, who's that? That Satan will be cast out. And I, I, if I am lifted up, will draw all to myself. So this is how he wins the great controversy. He wins the great controversy by loving to the point of utter and complete self-sacrifice. So that voluntarily you and I can look at that sacrifice and say, I don't see power, control, manipulation. What I see is perfect, other-centered, self-giving love. So Jesus is exalted to the throne of the universe by the general assembly of human beings saying, just and true are your ways. You're good. You don't have to take the throne of the universe. We're giving it to you because you are the only rightful ruler of the universe by virtue of the fact that you only live in love. So Jesus draws us to himself. And when he got on the cross, Paul frames it in great controversy language. That when Jesus died on the cross, what happened? Well, he disarmed the powers and authorities, that is, of evil and darkness. And he made a public spectacle of them, triumphing over them by the cross. When Jesus died on the cross, you guys picture the scene. When Jesus is dying on the cross, here's essentially what's happening. The devil is pushing him through torture to... to live for himself, to preserve himself. The three groups of people around the cross all said the same thing as mediums through which the demonic voice was speaking. If you're the Son of God, save yourself. If you're the Son of God, save yourself. If you're the Son of God, save yourself. If Jesus would have saved himself, he would have participated in the principle of selfishness and the great controversy would have been lost. But Jesus, according to John chapter 13, Scripture says he loved them to the end. To the utter and complete end of himself. He kept on loving us to the complete end of himself. So when Jesus breathed his last breath, a public spectacle was made of the principalities and powers of darkness. The devil and all his demons were terrified by the fact that the principle by which they govern selfishness was proven to be ultimately false by Jesus dying on the cross. So that the cross was the fatal blow to Satan's kingdom. How was the cross the fatal blow to Satan's kingdom? Because at the cross, Jesus proved that God is love in the most beautiful sense imaginable. Selfless, other-centered love triumphed over evil. You and I now look to the cross of Calvary. It captivates our hearts. It uproots selfishness from us as a governing principle. And we are reborn as creatures who love like 